And in fact, it led to a lot of Senate hearings and things were changed. But uh, the CIA that Luis Posada, Luis Posada gets involved in the CIA before Bay of Pigs. He's living in Havana. He is recruited probably by uh, David Atlee Phillips, people, not, uh, famous people, How e. Howard, uh, e. Howard Hunt, all these names that became quite celebrated who were working out of Havana immediately after the revolution to, to, to try to sabotage the new government or regime, whatever you want to call it. And uh, Posada worked inside Havana, then got out uh, in, in the early 60s, immediately went into Fort Benning, Bay of Pigs. But what happened with the, the um, CIA is uh, some of these guys, even then, as I said, things were getting a little out of control. And these guys were not entirely just doing exile militant activities. There seemed to be a pattern where there were little couple sidelines that made the CIA uncomfortable, like drug dealing, um, uh, and, and so that it was... And the it was aware that Carillas was involved with... Posada Carillas, yeah, he was... Uh, they were, uh, well, they, they had, they had indications... With types and with some drug... Yes, yes, the other elements that made them a little nervous. So they were more than happy to say, uh, fine, set yourself up with deceit, Venezuelan intelligence under Carlos Andres Perez, and you know what? We're just like a sister group, it's a sister organization anyway. Some people say, well, that's almost like deceptive rendition for the CIA back then. So if things were really a little too hairy, they could they could turn to deceit and say, you know, we got a little problem down there. You know, these are there's some guerrillas over there. We have some characters over here. You wouldn't mind checking this out in Colombia. So there was a certain amount of symbiotic relationship. Deceit truly was the Wild West. And it is out of deceit that, uh, which was entirely run in the 1970s by Cuban exiles. He, he Orlando more Garcia, uh, Orlando Bosch, El, uh, the famous figure is Mono Morales, monkey, El Mono. Um, and these guys were real characters. I mean, these guys, El Mono was informing for Venezuelan intelligence, the CIA, the DEA, the FBI, and Miami-Dade intelligence, and no doubt the, the Cuban intelligence organ, DGI. This was, a, I call this period Casablanca on the Caribbean. These guys had so many balls in the air, and remember this is a period of tremendous amount of narcotics trade coming out of Latin America. This is, this is the discovery of cocaine. The, everything came through Caracas. So, and you know how they say about Miami, Miami was built on the, you know, was, it gave its renaissance, came out of, uh, you know, the, 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 those wild and woolly drug years. Last question, Luis Posada Cariles, uh, back to our intelligence agency and him on the CIA payroll. The U.S. government trying to get you to testify against him, their own asset. Explain. Disgraceful. Um, well, uh, it, what happened was very few people write about this area that I write about. And in Miami, there's some very good reporters, but it's very limited uh, journalism because... There's a lot of kind of quiet complicity between the Miami media, and Miami justice. There's, you can only go so far if you have a um, if you want to have a long-term career or even long-term health in some some instances. So um, I, I was always fascinated that this guy acted with so much impunity because he was legally, technically a fugitive, and yet we knew he was slipping in and out of the country. We knew he had run. Uh, been a main central player in Iran-Contra. So I, um, when I heard that he had slipped into Miami through my sources and he was being seen at Versailles and various famous watering holes in Miami and I heard that he was there, I wrote one of my pieces in the Washington Post Outlook, which I often write, saying, our man's in Miami. Has anyone noticed that a man who's a fugitive, who's done 11 years for the shoot-down of a Cubana plane, who's suspected in this case and in this case, has anybody in law enforcement noticed that he's living a very public life? I think he's about to buy a condo, and he's on the no-fly list. Uh, so I wrote this piece in the Washington Post Outlook. Well, you, you know, if it was in Miami, they probably wouldn't have paid any attention to it. Well, that was just too much. So the next time Posada gives one of his press conferences, they came in and they arrested him. But not like a normal person. He, he was arrested and given a golf cart, and then he was taken away. Um, and then um, what happened is um, 
uh, what I learned, the most shocking thing I learned, and it's in part two of uh, Without Fidel, is um, I learned through one of my sources, or several of my sources, the Miami FBI, that in the summer of 2003, uh, the Miami FBI took their files on Posada. They decided to close the case. They, got the, they had to get the okay from the U.S. Attorney Marcos Jimenez, who was very, very active in the Bush-Gore recount, uh, a lawyer down there. He became U.S. Attorney. And they had to get his okay, and they had to get the okay of the special agent in charge and the supervised the FBI. And they decided to close the case, which greenlighted the destruction of five boxes of evidence and files on Luis Posada in the summer of 2003. The agents who worked on it were staggered. It took them 20 years to put this stuff together, in some cases. I found out about this. I called up the spokesperson and I said, I've heard that you've closed the case and they cleaned out the bulky, which is what it's called, and you've sh shredded the evidence, shredded it. She says, well, that's routine. We shred everything. I said, can you tell me why you closed this particular case? And she said, it was just a routine house cleaning. You know, the bulky was just getting too filled up with storage materials. So I said to her, you know, did it occur to you that instead of making room in the bulky, by destroying the evidence and the files of the most famous, notorious figure to ever come through South Florida, then maybe you could have taken some of those carjacking cases from the 80s that were closed. And then she said, oh, she said, well, you know, she says, no one, no one knew where he was. Who knew where he was? He just disappeared. I said, well, you know, that's not really quite true because he was just arrested in Panama for the attempted assassination of Fidel Castro. He was in prison. That's where he was. It was on the front page of most papers. She said, oh. And, um, and I said, well, I'd have a few more questions. I said, why this case was chosen of everything to do the house cleaning? This is what happened. This is, the, this is what needs an obstruction of justice investigation. So they, having destroyed their files, they then turned to the media, Fourth Estate. Well, I literally got a phone call from somebody at the FBI saying, do you mind if we look into your, CIA, your, F, your uh, FBI files on uh, Luis Posada. I said, well, don't be ridiculous. I got them from you. And he said, well, uh, he said, well, as a matter of fact, we just can't seem to find them. And I thought he was joking until I found out that this had happened. So how deeply, re it's, it's a horrible thing when reporters are asked to testify. It doesn't matter whether they're guilty or innocent or evil or bad or whatever they are, because when sources realize that reporters are going to have to testify against them in court, they're not going to speak to reporters anymore. And it's particularly distressing after the government destroyed their own evidence to then say, well, we don't have an us, so we'll bring a reporter in. We're talking to Anne Louise Bardock. Her book is Without Fidel, A Death Foretold in Miami, Havana, and Washington. We'll be back with her in a minute. Allá en mi 